the Sunstone. You're tuned into the Jewel Riders Archive. Hey, Jewel fans. Welcome back to another episode of the Jewel Riders Archive podcast, where we want to bring you the second half of our interview with Greg Torre, the creative director of the show. If you haven't listened to part one, go back and check the podcast archive, and you can see part one of the interview. We're picking it up with part two this time. We hope you enjoy this great interview. This now gets back to a previous subject, which was evidently a lot of the work that Robert Mandel did for Enchanted Camelot was actually done for a cartoon version of um, Ju- Ju- uh, Dragon Riders of Pern, where it was made into a female property, where Melody Melanie was a, a main character with animals, and you had the equivalent of. Sorry, I'm blanking on the name. The the main female character from Dragonflight. Lessa. Lessa, thank you. You had Lessa, and she was the main character, and she had the golden hair. There was another character, too. I don't remember who they used for the other one. But they had built these three characters into a line, an animated line they were proposing for for Dragon Riders of Pern. And it's my understanding that they were close to selling it in, but then Anne McCaffrey decided to pull the plug on it and decided she really didn't want to do it. Well, wait a minute. So let's go back to that then, because I think to clarify for people who might be confused, can we do a quick timeline here? Because Tanko and Jewel Riders were both being sold to Mattel, or at least trying to be sold, but then you had already left to Kenner. So I guess just a quick timeline on who had what property and at what point, and then kind of in, in a time order, basically. Okay. While I was still at Mattel, which I left in March of 94, they had been shown the Dragon Riders of Pern. They had not been shown Princess Tenko yet. And so actually what happened, let's go this way. Let me go back a little bit farther. First was <clears throat> was Wonder Woman and the Joel, and the Star Riders, which didn't launch. Right. Then I turned that into musical princesses. And about that time, somewhere in there, Mattel was shown Dragon Riders of Pern. I left. I was at Kenner. And somewhere right in in there, when I left, Dragon Riders of Pern went away. And Robert didn't want to lose all that work. So he turned it into a new script called Enchanted Camelot and used a lot of the same backgrounds and things that were actually beautiful that were developed for the first one. And so he brought that to Kenner, and at the same time, it was, I forgot the name of the company, it was the same company that does Power Rangers. Saban. 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 It was Saban. Saban was brought, shopping around. Tango. Saban did Tanko. Yes. And it was interesting because the guy, one of the guys who was actually pushing it that I was on the phone with was one of my old co-workers back at Mattel, which was kind of funny. <laughs> so he um, had gone to Saban. He had gone to Saban, yeah. Uh, I think he was a marketing at the time. And uh, okay, so then, so then I'm at Kenner. I'm working on Enchanted Camelot as a presentation piece only for testing and Tenko at the same time. There was a third line that I didn't do. I don't remember what it was, um, but it was some type of a small doll line. And um, and so those. There were three properties that were shown to kids all at the same time. And Enchanted Camelot scored the highest, so it won. So Kenner said, nope, no on Tenko. So then it would have been then be shopped over to Mattel. Now, it's possible that Mattel looked at it at the same time. I don't know that. Um, sometimes they, at least the beginnings, they will, they will try to make it a little more exclusive, you know, kind of like, hey, I'll give you the rights to this for the next three. I'll give you give you three months to look this over and have exclusivity, but any longer than that, you're gonna have to pay me some money, and I'll go show it to other people, or or I'll go show it to other people. So, 
it's it's possible Mattel did not see it until after Kenner turned it down. And that's that's what I would guess happened. Okay. So I thought it was really funny that the toy line that I also created or you know did models on went to Mattel and then Mattel made one, which was pretty funny. Well, that's the whole thing is that it basically, from the sounds of it, when you were talking about that it comes with its own little tricks and things like that, and it's the same size as the musical dolls. I mean, they basically just what Kenner, because you were employed by Kenner and you did the tooling for Kenner. And then basically what happened is after Kenner said, no, we don't want to do this toy, Mattel basically produced exactly what you created as a prototype. Yes. But of course, I on my prototypes, I used the Mattel tool, tooling. I guess it all and, comes back to the <laughs> to where it originally came from. Yeah. And so, but but what would have happened is the Bo no Bobot Bobot was Guinevere um, Saban would have shown all of those models or the photographs of all of those models to Mattel most likely. And gone here. Look, this is what we 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 looked at. This is what was tested. Blah 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 blah. I'm sure that they 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 probably weren't supposed to show those things, but I would be really surprised if they didn't. Right. I gotcha. Because I mean, it was already done, and they already had something at least to show to try to get them to buy it. Exactly. Okay. So one other thought on here, and this is coming from you from a creative, like a fashion designer standpoint. So for the costumes, the one thing that I did like about the Jewel Riders toy line that you talked about even as well, is that it came with plastic pieces and it also came with soft pieces, like, you know, the fabric, capes, skirts, things like that. The one thing that I enjoyed about Jewel Riders was that it had all those different accessories. Now, a part of me was kind of like, you know, I wish I could take the clothes, like the main suits, like the jumpsuits off of the Jewel Riders. But Tanko did that. Like their whole costumes were all fabric. And I didn't like that about Tanko. I often found it annoying when I was playing with them that the whole thing was like fabric because they were so small. I was like, I don't want all this. Like it's too much softness. And so that's the reason why I did like Jewel Riders. But going back then even further, back to like the accessory sets and like the play sets for storytelling, that is something that I always kind of wish that Jewel Riders had. And not even just Jewel Riders, but like Tanko or like the musical princesses. Like I wanted like accessory sets, like the separate clothing sets to be sold for those dolls. That was the one thing that I always wanted. Well, but you, what you don't want is to get into a situation like she with the fantastic fashions where they look ridiculous over the top of these molded doll bodies. Well, I think they that there's two like examples. Tarps. <laughs> there's two examples like that. You could go with that, or you could just go to the plethora of aerial fins that Tycho created afterwards, that there's like 30 different like fin styles that she could wear that aren't even true to the movie. But as a child, you're still like, oh, yeah, I want her to wear like this 90s neon whale pattern like that sounds fun you know if we had done accessory sets for princess guinevere i assure you they would have fit and looked adorable oh i'm i bet they would because yeah. i, I would not would. have i i am such a costume freak that they have to be right <laughs> uh, well okay now, so something to stem from this then because you made the Jewel Power, and then you made the Deluxe Adventure for, like, their party outfits. So, you know, in in their style guide, those are the two, but then there's also, like, their adventuring outfit, which is basically just minus the Jewel armor. But then there's other ones, like there's the jacket Guinevere, or there's, like, the Tamara with the big poofy sleeves. So for me, that's, like, what I would have thought would have been created. So I don't know... If, did you ever kind of toy around with the idea of creating accessories like that or creating like a, you know, king or a queen or like, you know, something else that, I don't know, like other characters outside of just the, the basic ones, basically? Those other outfits that you mentioned, um, I designed those. They were, they were, you know, Robert, let me do that. He needed new outfits and he... If, Either I would give him new outfits or he'd say, hey, I do need a new outfit for this, and I would design it. And so those ones were specifically made 
you know, to fit everything. And actually, and remind me to go back to color because color is very important. But um, let me finish this first. Yeah. We would have done more had the line sold. We would have done accessory sets. We designed um, some vehicles that never happened. We designed some play sets that never happened. And we certainly would have done more fashiony things with outfits that would have slipped over the figures. And the main reason that there is a big poofy skirt on the adventure dolls as opposed to the jewel power dolls is its price point. You know, the, the, the small ones, you only have so much money to work with. And it was like, what is it? I think there was a seven ninety nine price point at the beginning. That's exactly what I was just going to say. I, I think that they were seven ninety nine. Yeah. And then the other dolls were, I think, nine ninety nine or maybe eleven ninety nine. I think they were a little bit more. I think that they were like twelve ninety nine or something like that. Yeah. Some of them Soft still have price. I'll, we'll have to look at those. Okay. Soft goods is expensive because it's a lot of manual labor. And so the only way I could afford that was in the in the more expensive dolls but i made sure that the original set the low price one had some bit of that softness because that was the look that was working now colors let's talk colors for a second this is very important when i was at mattel and i was working with the on aladdin and they were doing the aladdin cartoon they were saying that they had problems where because of the young children watching the show, they couldn't change the costumes of the characters because when they did, like when they changed Jasmine into her different costumes, kids got confused and thought it was a different color. I'm sorry, they thought the different color outfit was a different character, didn't realize it was Jasmine still. And so I filed that away in the back of my head. And then when it came to Princess Guinevere, I also remembered that one of the things that you often do as a costume designer is that you establish the character often through a color palette. Like if you've got a villain, you're going to do him in reds and blacks and deep purples and things like that. And it's an automatic visual tell you know, right. representation right. of the character. You're gonna, it's you're color tell theory, the basically. Color. So yeah. when I came to design the real characters, one of the very first things I did was I designed the palettes for the three girls right off the bat because I wanted to work within that palette. And then, and then because then I could go back and say, look, you don't have to keep her in the same outfit the whole time. You just got to keep her in the same colors then she can have a snow outfit. Then she can have a mermaid fin. Then she can have all of these things and the kids will still understand who it is because they're more color sensitive. And then you're not stuck with having her run in the snow when she's got bare arms. <laughs> and so yes. it solved a major problem by, by keying in the colors palettes for everyone up front. And if, you, if you've ever seen the pictures in the style guide, it shows Gwen in her four outfits, and they're all pretty much the same colors, but it's a completely different style in each outfit. Right. And that was something that I appreciated about Jewel Riders yeah. was it wasn't the classic, you know, Simpsons situation where they wear the same clothes every single episode. You know, it was nice that the characters did change outfits and you saw them in different things, but I think exactly what you're talking about there was the color assignment to each of the characters. And I mean, yeah. even in establishing, you know, our own guidelines for the archive, I know that we follow the same things where, you know, Gwen is always in, you know, pinks, or at least if there's yellow or purple involved, it's according to the style guide, you know, Fallon's in teals and, and purples and yes. light lavenders. And the same thing with Tamara, she's always usually teal. So, you know, whether we're creating something new or a color palette, we're, we're continuing to follow that color palette. I mean, I noticed that you did that as well. And like I said, so when I create, like, let's say an item for sale that we have in like our, our shop, you know, it's always according to that color palette as well. Yes. Notice too that I cheated. How so? Because it used to be that you'd have a pink doll, you'd have a blue doll, you'd have a green doll or whatever. And the pink was always the top sellers. And, and you can be moan for 
however long you want about you're forcing girls to buy pink. <laughs> no, the girls are buying pink because that's the choice they're buying. That's the main with. character, usually. Well, it's, even if it's not the main character, they're going to buy the pink one. And, and we, we studied it over and over and over again. It didn't matter. I mean, even if you put Midge in pink and put Barbie <laughs> in blue. Poor Midge. They would buy Midge because yeah. they want pink. If you look at the popples, we did a hundred, literally 100 different color variations, put them in front of kids, had them pick them. The top three were shades of pink. So what I did was I cheated. I put Princess Guinevere in pink clothing, blonde hair. And then I put pink hair on Tamara. So I had two <laughs> pink dolls but they look like two totally different characters. So I use the best of both. And, and we've discussed this in some of the writing, but I was very particular about the skin tone and all the colors on Fallon because I hated the Afri African-American skin tone that Mattel used. They standardized all their colors and you could never change them. Um, I hated it because it always looked dead to me that skin tone looked dead. And so I made sure and picked a brown that was vibrant and looked like it had blood flowing in it and it had a glow to it. And at the same time, you could not tell, is that African-American? Is that Jamaican? You know, what is that? You know, it could have been several different skin tones. And so she became really the exotic character rather than an African-American character so that she could appeal to a broader audience. And ironically, I found her on a website one day on a list of the top 10 black dolls. They showed that figure. And the other irony was out of the top 10 black dolls, there was another one on there that I designed. <laughs> <laughs> was that the queen from Prince yes, of Egypt? That's right. Okay. The queen from Prince of Egypt. Well, I do think that those those color schemes are very lovely, and I and I will say, coming from at least from a child's standpoint, um, sometimes I would want the African American Barbie, like let's say that I I just thought that it told the story better, but when it just came to like regular, like let's say you know like bikini magic Barbie or something like that, like I wanted the pink one, like how you said, I didn't want the other one just because I didn't like the skin tone, and I think that as you said, she just it didn't have the same warm quality to it. You know, not to say that it was just, you know, the skin tone. It's just the fact that the doll itself did not look as loving. And for me, yeah. I think that that's one of the things that I saw. And so when it came to Fallon, I do really like her skin tone. Now, since you had mentioned the fact that, you know, she could identify with multiple people, you know, a lot of times when you look at, and it could be, it doesn't have to be a girl show, but it could be any particularly like magical girl style, like m animated series. There usually is the blonde, the purple hair, the pink hair, something like that. Like that's kind of the color schemes. So was there always the intention to kind of have like, well, this is your blonde kind of Caucasian princess. This is like your pink haired, lighter, <clears throat> lighter skinned doll this is like the you know more of like the ethnic doll like was there kind of that original instillment in the idea of enchanting camelot or because like was that for marketing was that storytelling was that to for audience to be able to identify with the character what was that usually it is it's to it's to broaden the appeal of the characters and it actually came that way from <clears throat> from robert mandel in the the show bible for Enchanted Camelot. Uh, they had her as, they had obviously Princess Guinevere was blonde. And then the names were different. I think Alex was the original name of. Yes, Fallon. Alexandra, shortened to okay. Alex. And she was just your basic black character. She didn't have purple hair. I added the purple. And we love hair. you for it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and purple is my favorite color. So I put it in wherever I could get it. Um, and then the other character was originally named Melody instead of Melanie. Um, 
and she had red hair and I changed that to, I softened it to pink. And again, we love you for that too. Yeah. Noticed <laughs> the skin tones were different between those two too, because I wanted to break it up still because Princess Guinevere has a golden, almost like a suntan, like a Malibu Barbie skin tone. And I made sure that that hair color was more like gold flowing out of her. I wanted her to be gold. And um, and so then when I went to Tamara, I gave her a very Irish lily white skin tone to balance off of the pink or red hair. And I specifically changed the skin tones between them just to add the, the fun variety. Right. And, and I think that that's something that definitely the fans have picked up because people sometimes do ask us they're like well what ethnicity are these people and the thing is is that you know outside of just the fact that they're fictional it's like well they take place in a fictional land they're in avalon so they don't really have ethnicities you could just say they're avalonian like you know we don't really know where they come from outside yeah. of just like their stories but people do sometimes ask that and i think that as a child i somewhat identified her probably because of like the pinkish colored hair and the lighter skin, I kind of saw her like an Irish princess. Like that's kind of how I saw her. So yes. as a child, I identified with Tamara. I think that because of my love for pink, but also later when she was in the mermaid episodes or, you know, because she had the heart stone. And I feel like even though you said that pink toys often sold better, I am curious though, from a sales perspective, did Guinevere sell more because there were more units? Was that the one that children identified with? Because now all the fans that have lasted with us through all you know these decades, the top favorite is Tamara. And, and hmm. honestly, Fallon is probably a second. So it goes Tamara, then Fallon, and then Guinevere is actually like, the, not to say that she's not loved, it's just she's not necessarily the fan favorite. Well, it's interesting because, you know, she was really... Tamara was really the heart. I mean, that's why she has the heart stone. She was the, the warmth, um, the empathy of the characters. And yeah. I mean, she's like a, the, was, the peacemaker character. Yes. Yeah. She was all about, she was the love. I mean, you know, she, she could talk to the animals and had the sense with the animals that the other ones didn't. Guinevere was about power. And that's why she, she had such, you know, golden, but still pink outfits but it was more of that leadership and power because of her sunstone. And the interesting one was Fallon because she was more of the adventure mystery. Um, you didn't really know what she might do next. And I was, I would have pushed that more um, given more time. And of course we, we developed three seasons selling seasons worth of product um, and actually three and a half because there was a minor variation that was supposed to ship of the the basic figures and they all had color change armor where it literally went from clear armor and then you got it wet and it would turn into pink or teal or purple and it looked really cool. It took us a while to get it right, but we, we had some really nice samples finally at the end. Um, those were supposed to ship and they were tooled. Um, there are samples of that that have leaked out onto the market, which have been pretty nifty. Right. Now with those ones, um, the first thing that you had mentioned was the color change armor. And yes. I know that when we were talking about Sleeping Beauty and the dwarves, like if you just have a little rag, and you wipe it across the special feature area, it changes. Now, because this was the different armor pieces, were you intending for children to like dunk them in water and then put them on the doll? Or like, for instance, like their head pieces, if like the adornments on the sides of the head were supposed to change, I mean, personally, I would never want to dunk the doll in water. So what was your intention of how children would change those colors? Or is it a heat change feature? All right. Well, you'll have to give me a little bit of leeway here because since it's been a while. Was, yeah, it's been a while. So, so that I, I honestly, 
I honestly can't remember if they changed with heat or cold. But at that time, kids were so used to doing color change that I really wasn't worried about it. Okay. That, you know, either, either they could go like, we had the, one of the very first color change toys was a Mickey Mouse by Mattel in the preschool department. And you could, he could get dirty and you could clean him up. And so for my daughter, we would keep him in the freezer. <laughs> when she was done playing, I'd put him back in the freezer. And then so he would always be uh, you know, dirty and ready to clean up. Um, just kind of funny. Yeah, I can't remember which direction it was now. Um, but That's okay, I, then. Yeah, I'm sure that I had a plan. I just don't remember what it was. No, it's all good. I mean, I know that there were a couple of those, like, um, for instance, like Ariel, like, oh, like, you know, when she's out of the water, she, her fins are one color, or like her body, or like some of the Barbies had like tattoo marks that appeared with warm water. I think the Pocahontas dolls did that too. But like, you know, they would show in the cartoons, like, oh, like, you know, you take your Ariel for a swim and you dunk her in the water and then she changes color. And that was the worst thing I could possibly think to do with your toy. Because then once you get that hair wet, it's awful trying to dry it again. And then it just gets <laughs> ratted. And so for me as a child, I guess I was always kind of having any playtime was still being, you know, used as like, okay, but what about, you know, collectability? Like I want to keep these in good condition at least. And we only did those, we only did the color change armor on, the low price dolls because they just have the plug of hair, mm -hmm. which is a whole lot easier to maintain than trying to make the whole root. Hair. Right. Yeah. Oh my God. So I never, yeah. never put the color change with that, but okay. there was some other really cool ones. Actually the, the, the third set of the low price figures, they had action features. Like you would squeeze the arms on Fallon and her legs would flip back and forth like she's running really fast. And we had made armor pieces that kind of like grew out of the armor and extended. So on hers, she suddenly got like wings on her boots that were supposedly propelling her faster. But they were wings that were like jeweled armor wings. And um, yes, Guinevere had like shoulder armor that would expand out for battle and um that would you know it'd be thin and then it would it, you know have a few more layers on it there was another one but i forgot what the third one was now tamara has a shield i think that's right her shield she had a gauntlet and then you could flip kind of flip it open and it would turn into a, a full shield and uh, we did it with the horses too where the horses had parts on the saddle that would flip down to become more armored. And of course my, my Mark's Knights, going back to that, one of my favorite parts was fully armored horses, which was just amazingly cool. <laughs> still yeah. is. Um, still one of my favorite toys. And I show it to people now and they're like, wow, this is a cool new toy. It's like, no, it's 1967. Um, and people are just still amazed by that. Um, I think that we've also seen the prototypes of the expandable wing as you're talking about. And and it kind of just, it was uh, the Sunstar Pegasus saddle with the wings, just the wings changed and then they were able to be expanded out. Um, but I think that this was this put was onto a like a moon, a moon dance. dance prototype, right? Yes, it was. And on that one, it was a particularly cool because it was in a position where you could tilt it, it could be running, looking, the horse was looking like it was running, and then you could tilt it up and make it look like it was rearing. Right. And, and if you tilted it all the way up, it actually had a hard molded tail, and it would, that was the trigger, it would shoot off a beam of light from its moonstone. Yeah, uh, listeners can actually see photos of this particular moon dance in the part four of our interview series with Greg on the website just fyi and it's a really cool piece that yeah, I, we're actually in the process of hopefully acquiring soon from another collector for the archive i i spent a lot of time i find it interesting like getting them right well it's beautiful i just find yeah. it interesting i guess 
on the way that the dolls just morphed <laughs> and changed, as you will. But, you know, when it first started and you have these really just fun, a basic set of jewel power, and then you have the deluxes, which is just their party outfit. And it, it, it felt like, you know, this was all very much like what was in the series. It's what I saw in the first season. And then in the second season, with the change of the magic armor, which can be seen in the Toy Fair catalog, and that's where we have a lot of our images from, where we have new jewel armor, Gwen, Fallon, and Tamara, and then we also have the jewel adventure deluxes, so you have a new flying Gwen, the mermaid Tamara, and then visible Fallon. Now, I know that you know, some of those things, those features, like for instance, Invisible Fallon was seen like once. Mermaid Tamara came up, you know, twice. Flying Gwen, I guess, was, you know, just flying through the magic, but it's just like, it became more adventuresome. And I think that the yeah. same thing with the jewel powers and then just even the change in the horses, like how you said, you know, from being, I think that these were the fashion star Philly molds to where now this new one like has expandable wings and it shoots out this beam of light. And, you know, there's all these like more adventuresome. So was that just you trying to make it more adventuring because that's what you found interesting? Was it trying to expand out the line or was that direction given from the executives who were saying, we want to see more action? No, no, that was me. Okay. So it was just I, you kind of wanting to do more with it. I did it because it, it's what was separating us from the other dolls on the market. It, because the other ones didn't have all that adventure play. And, and so we had an adventure cartoon we could actually do that with. So I pushed the adventure even more. And the funny thing was, I would come up with those. This is where I got into a lot of the storylines. I would come up with stuff and I'd be like, hey, Robert, I found a way to make you know, one of the characters invisible. So can we work that into an episode? And he was usually very accommodating. Um, and like the whole episode with the um, the mermaids was another one where I'm like, I want to make I want to make an armored you know jewel armored tail mermaid. I want to turn her into a mermaid. Can I do that? Can we can we make an episode with that? So that happened because I actually made the toy first, that or the concept of the toy first. And I went to Robert and said, Can I make this? Can we add this into the because anything I made, I wanted it added into the cartoon as much as I possibly could. Which I appreciate as a child who despised toys from a show that didn't look like the show yeah. or I didn't really have anything to do with the show. Yeah. And, and I, I would be like, just just even if you give me a scene or two, just just get it in there someplace. Yeah. And uh, so the now biggest example is actually the zebra corn. Now, this was actually a mandate from marketing, which w they came back and said, well, okay, so you've got two horses and you've got three main characters. Can I have a horse? Can I have one more horse? And so... <laughs> well, I was asking that question too. <laughs> yeah. And, and so... and Because at the time, she was... Her, her deal was she was supposed to have the small animals instead. But we never released the small animals. And so marketing came back and one of the few things that they actually influenced was they came back and said, no, we, we want a third horse. And I'm like, well, okay, we've got a Pegasus. We've got a unicorn, and a, you know, kind of a Pega unicorn to begin with, but or, um, and then got, you know, Yeah. And so I thought, I gotta do something different. How do I make something different here? And it suddenly it came to me about, wait, let's make a zebra corn. <laughs> and then I actually came up with the whole plot line and went to Robert on it and said, okay, this is what I, I, this is what I need. This is how we could introduce it. So that entire script came from not, I didn't write the script, but it came from the storyline I created and the whole, you know, some things may not look as nice and be discarded when you first look at them. But if you take a closer look and take the time to care for them, they can be far more valuable. You know, take take time to look at people instead of just judging them real quick. Don't judge them by their cover. And it, that's that's the story that was really happening there that I was able to tell through the you know the, the zebra corn. I still think it was one of the the coolest parts of the coolest toy that we made in that set. It just was nothing was like that. 
well, like Tamara herself, I think that Shadow Song has resonated with fans as well. And not only do we see fans trying to create custom versions of their toys where they take, you know, whether it's a Fashion Star Philly or a Sun Star and paint it themselves. And we've seen several of those and they're beautiful. But yeah. exactly what you said, there's something about Shadow Song and the Zebra Corn that stands out that's unlike any other animal that you've seen. And yeah. In time, as it's passed, we see a lot of fan art of unicorns that are zebras. And a lot of times people do credit, you know, Shadow Song. And they go back and they say, oh, I remember as a child, I saw this zebra unicorn and it was really influential to me. And, and so I still love unicorns to this day because of that. And the unicorns are truly one of those characters that resonated with the fans. And I think that it's one of the things that a lot of people love. And of course, unicorns are still fashionable and they're still popular but was hey, there something in love with the unicorn exactly <laughs> exactly i mean it's a mythical animal that's fun and if one flies perfect but yeah. i mean did you see something like in zebras or had you seen something that was a zebra corn before that or like what what influenced you to create such an animal basically i like sticking new things together okay and <laughs> and and it still is a it achieved both things because it achieved giving him a horse, but I wanted, but it had to be special. It had to be unicorn <clears throat> and making it with glitter stripes, you know, made it even cooler. I got just, <laughs> I, I like always pushing the boundaries um, and making things special. I mean, I was just told the other day that you know, no, everything you do, you make it a little bit different. And that's, that's what I try for. I'm trying to make things special. And to my knowledge, I'd never seen a zebra corn before. I I tried, I'm, I'm pretty sure I came up with it. Now it's okay. possible that I saw a sketch someplace that I don't remember, but there certainly wasn't any toy or character in a movie that was a zebra corn before that. Gotcha. Yeah, I had never really seen anything. I just didn't know if maybe you were influenced by, you know, maybe some medieval art or something. I don't, I don't know. I'm always, always influenced by medieval art. I, I <laughs> you know. I, I had plenty of my armor books that were always there. And, and actually, I got to see some of the ancient tapestries of unicorns in France on the walls. Mm. Um, it still stuck with me. I know I had an experience a couple of years ago to go see the um, Met Cloisters in New York. And they've got some beautiful, I think they're 14th century unicorn, the Hunt of the Unicorn tapestries. Yes. And it's like, oh, they're just incredible. Yeah. And it's like we've had this we've had this mythical animal for so long and it's never ceased to inspire and amaze. One of the interesting things historically on that is if you look, I think it's that set of tapestries. Yes, we're gonna talk art history for a moment. <laughs> um, what was happening was because the unicorn was a popular character, and of course it was on the you know, some of the her heraldry at the time. And um but the whalers would come back from the North Seas with um, narwhal. narwhal horns yes. and say, hey, we found unicorns. They wouldn't <laughs> say they cut it off of a baby whale. They just said they you know, found unicorn horns. And so if you look at some of those tapestries, I think particularly that set, the size of the horn yes. <laughs> is, is really based on a narwhal horn. Incredibly long. They actually yeah. had a, a real, like, from that era narwhal horn there with it for comparison. Yeah. And it was incredible. Yeah. It was really neat to see. I'm like, oh my gosh, the things are like four feet long. Yeah. And I mean, like, oh my God, if a horse actually had this on its head, I don't know if it could actually lift its head. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very fun. Um, there was, there was something that I had asked you earlier, but I do want to go back to this. And also, Greg, I want to be mindful of your time as well. How are we doing on time? Um, well, we probably should wrap this up soon. Okay. So um, I want to ask you two questions then, and then we'll be wrapping up. Um, the first question is regarding the mermaid Tamara. Um, you had said about how you wanted to create a mermaid. So a lot of times... I don't know, there's this myth out there, and I think that we've already debunked this in the written interview, but fans do ask, like, oh, so 
you know, a toy company wanted to create this property. So they basically created the toy line and then they made a cartoon around it. Now, there obviously are instances like how you said where you wanted to create a specific idea and then they worked it into the storyline and then you made a, a toy out of it. But truly, there never really is a specific incident where it's just basically a complete animated series that's based around just the idea of wanting to sell a toy. No, it's always it's always in conjunction. I mean, like it, particularly, I mean, th this is actually Princess Guinevere is probably the best example of working with a toy company and the animation up front and trying to get it all correct. Um, because, like for instance, later, pretty sure it was later, there was something Camelot. It's a terrible movie. Uh, King Arthur, or what was it about? Was it live action or is it animated? It was, it was an animated... Quest for Camelot. Like, Quest for Camelot. Terrible movie. <laughs> well, the first five minutes are good. Yeah. yeah. Well, but, it, and of course, this is now going you know, public for anyone who listens, but the first director was just a snot, and he wouldn't change anything to try to make it more sellable. And there were little things that we could have done that would have made a better toy out of it, that would not have changed the integrity of the property. But he was dead set. He was not going to let a toy company influence his film. Um, so you worked on the Quest for Camelot toys for Warner? I did. I'm trying to remember who I was working for. At was it like Toy Biz or something? Or You know what? I actually have them sitting two feet from me. Let actually, me look at the box. <laughs> So it was actually done with N2 Toys, but it's I like, forgot what yeah, their name was. It says Warner Brothers Toys. Okay. Sorry, that uh, company... Oh, copyright 1997 Hasbro. There it is. Hasbro. Okay. So what happened, This was that was a really unique situation. Several of the people keep... Well, most of the people at Warner Brothers Toys at the time came from Kenner, okay? And they still had contacts. So we co-developed the... Was it Kaylee? Yeah. Kaylee, yeah. Okay, so there was there was a, a fashion doll for Kaylee that was a low price one and a fashion doll for Kaylee that was a higher price one that didn't ship. Actually, did either of them ship? Uh, well, I mean, I have one, so... I can't we remember. We did make the toys, but... Well, okay. I think it was just the one version. I think I've only seen her in her yeah, armor. I've only ever seen one of her and one of Garrett. Okay. Um... So, well, anyway, because there was fashion dolls that were designed. And then there was the little figures that came out. They were about, like, a little bit bigger than Princess Guinevere. And those were all sculpted by the Warner Brother Toys people. And the fashion dolls were done by Hasbro people. And there was some co-mingling in between the two um, on the designs. Because I know that I, I took a trip to go meet the Quest for Camelot people in Hollywood for that movie where I met the director. Oh. So that was an odd code development. Then later that director was fired and they brought in someone else who had more openness. He's it, basically, if he didn't, uh, if he didn't mess up his movie, he didn't care. And so they is were that why this movie is a directorial mess. <laughs> yeah. It is, because I'm pretty sure that that one had at least three directors. Oh. Yeah. I'm 90% sure there was someone else before the guy I met, and I know there was one more after that. And it just, the movie didn't hang together. It had some nice pieces, but it just never hung together. No, it did not. No. It's a shame, because there were some nice toys that were designed. That, oh, yeah. That, yeah. Okay, so then that's a good example of, you know, like I said, debunking basically the myths around that. So on a personal note, um, the mermaid Tamara, at least the prototype, the one that was featured in the Toy Fair catalog, has this hard plastic like tail that she steps into. Was it never just thought to just make a separate mold? Like, okay, I don't want human Tamara. Like, just make her mermaid Tamara and sell her like that. No, I didn't. I didn't want it. Sorry, it's my fault. <laughs> I wanted I wanted the main characters to be the main characters, and I wanted, because it went back to, 
she wouldn't be a mermaid. It was really the manifestation of the, of the magic around her. Okay. And that, that's why I made it that way. And, and is that why it also... it's hard? Well, I was going to say, is that why it's hard plastic, though? Why didn't you just take, like, I guess it's just looking back on this because I didn't have it as a child. So I really don't know how I would have reacted to it. But I think that I would have pre preferred, like, the Tycho cloth fins of Ariel. Like, yes, she's human, but if you just slip her into, like, this, like, fabric fin, I think I just, I don't know. For me, aesthetically, I think that I would have liked that more as a child. But I, I couldn't carry off the look that it was magic tinted armor when it, if, when it was fabric. Okay. If there was a way, I would have pulled it off because <laughs> I've done things with soft goods that no one else has. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually my specialty. But there wasn't a good way to do that. I needed it to still feel like it was armor magic. Could it have been sleeker? And better looking, yeah, I wish it was. I was always a little disappointed in that. Yeah. And if I hadn't crooked the knee on the figures originally, I probably, that would have helped too. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of a combination, and um, it could have looked better. It still looked nice, but it could have looked better. Okay. And and speaking of inspiration, you know, I we had originally asked about Drake, if that was tooled from a different toy or where, or if he was an original mold. And then the unicorns, as far as we know, they were from fashion star Phillies, but I'm assuming that that's just because Kenner released those at the same time as well. No, the fashion star Phillies, Phillies were shipped before a couple of years before, and they did have the tooling. And um, we, we went ahead and based the line using those as the, the standard for the size. So because basically everything else came out of the the ability to reuse the Fashion Star Philly molds. Yeah, that that was the because you know when you make it into new toy lines, like what size do you make it? You know, of course, it, yeah. There's a lot of different factors, and this particular one that worked, and I I had no objection to it because those those sculptings were beautiful, and they're very expensive tools to make those horses uh, because the way they're made. Um, but they were beautiful, so I had no problem. All I did was add jewels to them. And right. mm -hmm. we added in features and stuff. To talk about Drake, Drake was his own figure. That that was never used for anything else. That's that's it. Now, what I did do is I went in and I made him more buff and muscular than the normal like Ken is to Barbie. Okay. Very much so. Ken's a wimp. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you know, Barbie would go, would go with GI Joe. Sorry. Um, it's just he looked a little too sleek. But the interesting thing was actually at Mattel, and I didn't see this, but I heard about it that they actually did test one. They made a more muscular Ken, and um, the little girls did not like it. So that never happened. So he became more defined in his musculature, but still was very sleek. So I, I needed to make sure that he, I wanted him, I wanted him to look distinctly male from the female dolls and have a little bit more of the full male, more buff structure. Um, the head I never got right. I was never happy with the head. Um, <laughs> it just, just. I, I should have paid more attention to, to getting that made right, and um, I didn't. I tried to get a smirk on his face, and it just didn't work as well as it could have. Well, I think um, there's a lot more stories, and we'll have to save those for another time. But yeah. I think that there's a lot more to ask and talk about with the individual of each of the dolls. But I think that this is a yes. good introduction. I think that a lot of people will yeah. get a lot of, out of this. Yes. And we didn't even talk about the Wave 3 figures. I know. I know. <laughs> like I said, we have a lot more to talk about. Yeah. But this great. is just just episode one with Greg, basically. It looks like my outline was very pie in the sky for what we'd <laughs> actually get yeah. to. But I exactly. love it. I love it. I love that there will be more opportunities to speak right. oh. and delve a little deeper. One other weird thing, just for all the people who collect all of that era, um, I did also work on Peppermint Rose. And Mattel at that same time period. I love those. They're so cute. Just gorgeous dolls. And actually, the, 
the lady who actually came up with the final look was actually a Disney costume designer. She had been a Disney costume designer. She was no longer with Disney and she was working with us and she's actually back at Disney in charge of a costume department again. And she's just still one of the most amazing designers. Oh, that's really cool. It's a beautiful yeah. story how everyone, you know, still ends up working with each other in one way or another. And then you go back to different companies and you're still continuing to, you know, inspire new lines and inspire new toys and all that fun stuff. So to end it, I know, Greg, you have your 12-inch um, fashion or the 12-inch wonders. 12-inch um, treasures. Treasures, I'm treasures. sorry. Yes, can yes. you do a, do a little outro to advertise if people want to see more about you or hear more of your stories? Yes, and actually, and I, I will say that I had to take a, a short hiatus while I was moving, um, but just yesterday, I finally got another one public, another post out there because it's been a two and a half two and a half month lag so we're back up and um and working on it again and i basically it's mostly focused on 12 inch figures although i do jump around occasionally like i had people kind of you know begging me would you do big jim please <laughs> and big, big jim is only like 10 inches but so i've done several um of the posts on big jim and showing things that were happening overseas that we never shipped. And I try to, I always put in background information, behind the scenes information on anything I'm doing is anything I can get. Because if I can't get the background information, it's less interesting to the people who are used to following my work, who like to follow it. But uh, it's, so I bounce around. It's not just all GI Joe. It is old Mark stuff. It's captain action. There'll be Barbies. There'll be, there'll be, um, actually I've got a lot of the Disney stuff. The irony is I haven't published as much of the Disney stuff because there's lots of Facebook groups and chat groups on the GI Joes and Marks and stuff, but I haven't found an audience to really talk much about the Disney stuff. And I have tons of it. I mean, the, I think the, we could probably help with that. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, I think that thing, we have some outlets. Do, okay. Yes. Yes. So, the, and that's been fun. Actually, the, the interesting thing is I got a post the other day on, it was actually the Mark site and someone was saying, Hey, there was this really cool website that I must've lost it. And it was, it was a person who worked at Mattel and Hasbro I was always talking about like 12 inch heroes or something. Does anyone know what happened to that? <laughs> he's like, well, he's only been gone for about two and a half months. But yeah. You know. yeah. So I actually replied back and said, okay, it's my fault. Sorry, I'm moving. I'll try to get it back up. But I've actually received so many encouraging emails from people, you know, talking about, you know, I, they, I, what I probably the, the most typical I get, which is great, which is, I love hearing your inside stories and about your joy of toys. And, um, and, and that's a lot of what it is for me. I, I, I love toys and, and, and love talking about toys and, and, and I'm not happy to, or not afraid to say when some toys stink, <laughs> you know, some of them just stink and some well, of them, that's like, yeah, yeah. try to be honest with it. But the other, the other thing, I mean, the thing that still drives me is when I see a toy, when I see a child with one of my toys. Recently, I actually went to the YMCA to blow off some steam because it's been a bad day, still making toys, but it had not been a good day. And I'm in the pool and I'm over exercising in the pool and I'm grumpy. <laughs> and, um, and I look over and there's this cute little family with a little toddler girl and they're giggling and playing and laughing between mommy, daddy, and baby. And, and then I noticed she was actually playing with one of my sparkle dive rings that are sold at Walmart. And it reminded me, it was like, it was a, it was a little gift from God at that moment going, Greg, remember why you're doing this. You're doing this for them. So look back at the joy that you just gave that child and remember to have that in your work. And um, it was just a wonderful little moment. Um, 
because when you make a toy for a child and they they react to it, you know, like I, I gave my granddaughter a toy the other day and she just started kissing it. First time she saw it, she grabbed it, hugged it, and started kissing it. And, and, and even the stories that you guys have told about the impacts the toys have made on your lives, that's what drives me and keeps me moving forward. Those are beautiful stories. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, them. that's amazing. But wait, before we go, but wait, there's more. Wait, wait, we, we need to do, you know, just, you know, a, a terrible, shameless promotion of my book because it's of not. Of course. So, so with all of the stories that, that I've, I've, I've mentioned about, yes, I came up with the storyline for the zebra corn and, and, and basis of the storyline for the mermaids and things like that. I was always, it's always about the story. Anytime I make a toy, it's about the story. So I finally had the cho chance last year to publish a book that got to use all of those story qualities, all of those stories that are hidden inside my brain and make it into a big full length novel. And, um, and it's, it was a blast. It was a blast writing it. And it's for, for people who, particularly like to go to science fiction conventions or if you've ever wondered what happens at a science fiction convention so if you're wondering what to read next go to amazon.com and you can look even look up my name for author greg autori but the book is called con at the con the lost blaster disaster um which is just a really fun book i hope everyone enjoys it and Here's, here's the, the world preview information. We're actually working on the audio novel version of it. Oh, wonderful. I love, I love a good audio book. Yes. And um, I'll be doing the voicing. So, you know, read by the author. So <laughs> we'll make sure oh, nice. all the voices are correct. <laughs> so well, that is fantastic. Yeah. And it's got great reviews. And anybody who loves conventions will, I'm sure, enjoy this book. I had my, my at the time, my 14-year-old my son was reading this and laughing, the early copies of it. And I thought, you know, the hardest thing in the world to do is to get a teenage boy to laugh. So I, I figured it must be reasonably good. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I will have to add it to my Kindle list next. Yes. Perfect. Well, okay. thank you so much, Greg, for sharing those stories with us. And thank you for sitting down with us for quite some time. But like I said, I think that we just tapped the surface. But there's just yes. so many wonderful stories. And I love hearing how everything connects together. That's probably the one thing that I love. And just the fact that, as you said, you did it for the kids. And at the time, we were the kids. And you made such an impact on our lives. So thank you for that. Yes, it's amazing to have you as always. And we're so grateful for you taking the time to speak with us, you know, once again. You know, we this is a, a Christmas tradition now, I think, for the Jewel Writers Archive to to give it's a gift to us but it's a gift to the fans as well to get to hear you know these behind the scenes stories and memories it just means uh, so much to us especially you know at this time of year when we're all thinking about it i am i'm honored to be part of it and and actually it was interesting because the fans really honored me without realizing it because one day just about i don't know but it was when you guys first started, I was flipping through a computer to see if it was brand. I knew it was just searching something, I, new software. I thought, well, let's look up Princess Guinevere, the Jewel Riders. And I found, to my amazement, that people were doing cosplay outfits of my characters, in my of my <laughs> costume characters. And that's what I did, you know, when I was, you know, 16 through 20-something, was making the costumes and going and doing that. And here were people taking my costumes and recreating them at conventions. And it really blew my mind. And so um, thank you to all the fans who have supported that and blown my mind and shown me the appreciation that it was just amazingly heartwarming. That's beautiful. Well, they're beautiful costumes as well. I mean, who wouldn't want to create their own cosplay <laughs> out of it? Yes. Oh, there, there was an amazing outfit that was done of Shoot, I forgot her name now. 
the second year bad lady. Morgana. Uh, Morgana. Morgana. Oh my gosh. There was a, this beautiful costume of this French young woman wearing this outfit that was like dead on. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I was just, just flipping out. So if you have to do a scene, wee wee magnifique. <laughs> wee. <laughs> C'est magnifique. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Greg. And I hope that everyone has enjoyed listening to behind the scenes of the storytelling of how Jewel Riders and the toys and how Kenner brought about this magic. It's been such a fun ride. So I want to thank everyone so much for listening. We've had a great time chatting with Greg. And if you want to know more, check out the notes for the podcast. We'll have links to his website, 12 Inch Treasures, and his book, The Con at the Con, on Amazon, and along with um, links to some of our previous interviews with Greg in text form. So, without further ado, we like to end as Princess Guinevere herself does. We want to say, friends together, friends, friends forever. forever. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for listening, and have a magical day. Bye, everyone. Anyone out there listening? No. Oh well, now that I've got some peace and quiet, I can go to work. By the magic of the sunstone, you're tuned into the Jewel Riders Archive. <laughs>